chapter 11 of Hebrews, if you will turn there. Chapter 11 of Hebrews, please turn there. And we're going to deal again with one verse. <laughs> and um, that would be the seventh verse. All right. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is of faith. And I won't talk about nor witnessing faith. Say that with me. All right. Nor witnessing faith. We continue our study of the book of Hebrews, which is the roll call of the faithful. You will find in the book of Hebrews, we call it the Heroes Hall of Fame. It is the great chapter in the Bible on faith. We're given a description of faith in verses one, two, and three. And then the writer takes us on a survey of the Old Testament characters who teach us out of their own experience of what faith is really all about. Now it becomes evidence in this chapter that the writer of Hebrews was very familiar with the Old Testament. Um, whether Paul or Luke or whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, they were uh, knowledgeable of the Old Testament. He begins in uh, verse three of chapter 11, talking about the creation. Um, and then in verse four, we looked at Abel, uh, chapter four, verse two. And there we discovered worshiping faith. Abel denotes worshiping faith. And then we looked at Enoch last Sunday, verse 5. He takes us to Genesis chapter 5. And we said that Enoch's faith is walking faith. The Bible says Enoch walked with God. And God took him. God translated him. Uh, he went to heaven and he didn't die. And... Uh, one of these days, if we're still living, when the Lord comes, he's going to take us also. Uh, what a beautiful picture it is uh, when the Lord catches up us with him and we'll be translated to heaven or resurrected. And so, oh, the delight of going to heaven without dying. Today we're going to look at Noah's faith, and we call it witnessing faith. And if you go back to Genesis chapter 6 through chapter 9, you will have this account of God directing Noah to build an ark so that he and his family would be preserved 
by the Lord. And then the aftermath of what happened after they came off of the ark. And so this character, Noah, uh, he witnesses to us about what it means to witness for the Lord. Uh, now now he, he deals with the flood here. Uh, the flood is one of the favorite subjects of the Bible. Uh, there are many ways to s study the flood. You can study the flood from a scientific point of view um, because there is ample geological evidence for the flood. Uh, we now know that there is solid evidence of the historicity and accuracy of the flood. Mm -hmm. um, the Lord Jesus referred to the flood. The writer of Hebrews here refers to the flood. So it's a very interesting subject. But that's not what I want to deal with today. I want to deal with this message nor as an example of witnessing faith. Now look at verse 7 again, because I want to divide it around several words, which I think will instruct us and help us to learn something about faith. I've already given you a working definition of faith. Uh, I've already said for some time that uh, in, in Hebrews chapter 1, Verse 1 and 2, it talks about faith is the, sub, is the substance of things, hope for, or evidence of things not seen. Yes, and I've said that that is not a definition, that is a description of faith. Mm -hmm. And I've given you a working definition of faith. Let me repeat it. Faith is the ability to trust what God says and act upon it regardless of the circumstances or consequences. That's a working definition of faith. And so living faith trusts whatever God says and acts upon it. That's a beautiful illustration here in these characters of what faith is all about. The first word I want to marshal my forces around is the word revelation. 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 You write that word down. Revelation. Look what he says in verse 7. By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Look at the last part of that verse. By faith Noah being warned of God or things not seen as yet moved with fear. And so I want to marshal my forces around the word revelation because God revealed himself and his will to Noah. We believe that God is a God who has revealed himself through the creation. God has revealed himself preeminently in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God has communicated. God has revealed himself through revelation of the written word, which is our Bible. So the Bible here says, Noah being warned of God, it means warned by divine instruction. It means that God spoke a message to Noah. Now you remember um, some time ago when we went through the book of Hebrews, you remember it says in chapter 1, God 
did speak in Old Testament times. Look at what he says. God who at sundry times and in divers manners, that is in many pieces, and in divers manners, that is in many ways, spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophet. So God revealed himself in a warning message to Moses. Moses received this revelation of God. Now, although there's no specific statement made here in the scriptures about it, I personally believe that there were others who heard God speaking to Moses. But Moses surely heard God speak. Uh, God gave him a warning message. God said to Noah, Noah, that's going to be a flood. A flood is going to come, and I'm going to destroy the world with a flood. Noah, I'm going to give you directions for the ark that you are to build. And when you're inside the ark, and when you are safe in the ark, mm -hmm. then it's going to rain. Mm -hmm. Notice in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, uh, we, we get a brief picture here of, of God sending the flood. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. In other words, man had become corrupt on the outside as well as on the inside. That's what that verse is saying. That's always what happens. Unredeemed human nature left to itself always goes to corruption. So here is a world that is filled with corruption. God said in Genesis chapter 6 verse 3, My spirit shall not always strive with man. What he's saying is, there will come a time when the patience of God has been exhausted. That's, I'm trying to give you the background of why the flood. God's patience sometimes will become what? Exhausted. God is a God of love, but he's also a God of justice. He's also a God of judgment. Though he calls and moves, and though he warns and woos, and though he pleads, there will come a time that God's patience is exhausted. There'll come a time God will say, that's enough, I've had it. Let me make it plain. <laughs> that's what happened here and why the flood. So he says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 6, look at it. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him at his heart. Look at verse 7. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. Notice the last part. For it repented me that I made man. Now, you know, the Bible says that God is a God that does not have to repent. In Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. So it's not repentance in the sense that we use the word repentance, which means to turn away from sin. The idea is that God is sighing deeply. It's a picture of the grief of God. God's heart is broken. That's what he's saying. The fact that God's heart is broken because of sin in the world. So it's necessary for God to scrub the board and clean it and start over. And so he's going to do it by means 
of the flood. You know the story. Later on, when the flood is over, God put a rainbow in the sky. And God said, I'll never destroy the earth again with water, but it'll be fire next time. That's what God said. And so in those days, that was the judgment. It was a world of sin and a world of corruption. But there's a bright spot in the midst of this corrupt society. Notice Genesis chapter 6, verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, listen, here's a man who heard the warnings of God and he believed. Somebody asked me, well, how did, the old, how did the people in the Old Testament get saved? Well, he got saved like we get saved. It's right here. He got saved by the grace of God. God spoke to him, and he believed what God said. That's what grace is all about. That's what salvation is all about. Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. And so Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God said to Noah, there's going to be a flood. And you need to build an ark. And if you build that ark, you'll be safe from the judgment waters that will occur. And the Bible says, by faith, Noah believed God. <laughs> and then God saved him by his wonderful grace. So he hears God's message, but not only does he hear God's message, watch it, he heeds God's message. <laughs> That's what faith is. <laughs> faith not only hears the word, it heeds the word. It does what the word says. That's what faith is all about. And so Noah heeds the word of God. He believed it, and he started acting upon it. And so it's not enough just to hear the word of God. You to respond in obedience to the word. You don't come out here Sunday morning just to hear. Good God Almighty. When you leave here, you heed. <laughs> you do what the word says. Somebody said, well, Pastor, sometimes you lay some heavy stuff on us. I know it. <laughs> I lay heavy stuff on myself. You see, the word of God is to me first, right. then to you. Right. Have we got a witness up in here? Right. You see, 1 Thessalonians 5, 24 says, faithfully, watch it. Listen, this verse revolutionized my life. Faithful is he who calls us, who will also what? Do it. What will he do? Whatever needs to be done. Let me say it again. Faithful is he who calls us who will also do it. You not by yourself. God helps you do what he calls you to do. Why? Because he's the dynamic of his own demand. Whatever he demands from us, he enables us to do. Hold me up, Holy Ghost. Are you with me? Are you following me? All right. And so sometimes we think, well, you know, that's hard. You know, <laughs> I thought about the disciples the other day. Jesus laid some heavy stuff on them, and they said, Master, increase our faith. <laughs> you remember that? They said, yeah, it's some heavy stuff. <laughs> increase our faith. <laughs> That's what God will do, because faithful is he who calls us, who will also what? Do it. And so he not only heard God's word, he heeded. God's word. So the first word here is revelation. What is faith? Faith is trusting what God says and acting upon it. You see, that's why anybody in this building, if you're a sinner, you can be saved today if you hear and heed what God says. That's what faith is all about. You see, Noah saw what other people didn't see through the eyes of faith. Stay with me now. Faith is a brand new set of spiritual eyes. 
you see things through the eyes of faith that you don't see through ordinary eyesight. Good God Almighty. That's what faith does. Faith brings the future promises into your present experience. You need to get that. Don't, 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 don't. <laughs> faith brings the future promises of God into our present experience through the eyes of faith. I've taught this church, whatever God gives me to tell you and to present to you, I don't need you to tell me why we can't do it. That ain't about nothing. You're supposed to be talking about how we can do it. And that's what this church has done over the years. Whatever I've presented, they've acted on it. Because that's what you do when God speaks. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. <laughs> that goes not only true for the church, but it's true for your personal experience. When God tells you to do something, you don't have to try to argue with him in terms of how it's going to be done. Just walk by faith. <laughs> Put your glasses of faith on. <laughs> Get in tune with your spiritual eyesight. And that's what faith is all about. So Noah saw things that others didn't see. And so when God broke through in his life, uh, Noah said that that's going to be a flood. Through the eyes of faith, Noah could see that mountain of water as it began to rise over the earth. Noah could see a huge ark that was to be built for the saving of himself and his family. Look at verse 7 again. The second thing it says is not only being one of God of things not seen as yet, look what he said, moved with fear. But Nad says, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. In other words, the second word I want you to write down is preparation. Preparation. Write the word preparation down. Preparation. Or readiness, but preparation. He put, look what he says in verse 7. He prepared an ark to the saving of his house. The word preparation means to make ready. The word preparation means to construct. So what we're told here is in response to the revelation of God, by faith, Noah engineered an ark. He constructs an ark. He makes ready an ark. He builds the ark. I don't have time to go into all this. It's fabulous. But in Genesis 7, we're told just how he built the ark. God gave him a blueprint in terms of how to build this ark, which will preserve them through the waters of the flood. Look at Genesis chapter 6, verse 14. The Lord instructs Noah and says to him, make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shall thou make in the ark, and thou shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. There are three arks mentioned in the Bible. Of course, the first one is here. The second one is over there in Exodus chapter 2, verse 3. Uh, you remember when um, an ark was made for the little baby Moses out of bulrushes. I preached on that. You remember that. And he was put in that little ark, a little papyra boat type thing, and he was saved from the crocodile infested Nile River. Uh, you remember that. 
and later on in the book of Exodus, when they built the tabernacle in the wilderness, it was the Ark of the Covenant. And in that was the tablet of stone, and there was a gold slab on top of that, and on top of that was the mercy seat. In each instance, every one of these ark is a place of refuge. It is a picture of God's rejection of sin, but also a picture of refuge and safety for those who are in the ark. And so God commanded Noah to build an ark. And he said, build it out of, out of gopher wood. Well, out of acacia wood which is incorruptible wood. That's what he says to him. Notice two things you're told here. It's to be made out of acacia wood, incorruptible wood. Now cutting through a lot of this background here and some of the side issues, this represents the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and salvation through him. So the ark is a picture of Jesus. That's why the incorruptible wood points to the blood of the Lord Jesus. The pitch there, the same word we find in Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11 for atonement. <clears throat> so that this ark is sealed on the inside and the outside. What makes the ark secure and safe is the blood of the Lord Jesus on the cross of Calvary. The ark that God commanded Noah to build is a picture of salvation that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. So old Noah starts engineering this ark. In fact, we're told in Genesis 6.22, look at it. Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him to do. He followed the blueprint to the detail. It was a huge ark, by the way. Look at verse 15 of chapter 6 of Genesis when it gives the dimension. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of the, of the ark 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. What does all that mean, Peter? Well, the length of it was to be one football field and a half. The length. The width would be the size of a football field. And the height of it would be four stories. That's really what that's saying. That's the size of it. Somebody said that's the size of it. Uh, when, when you look at the models of it, it really looked like a coffin. It was so constructed that it was virtually impossible to capsize. God told him what to do. God says, when you get this thing built and your family get in it, so by faith, nor believe God. And he engineered this ark. Now, 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 understand, people must have thought he was crazy. I mean, it had never rained. Understand that? I'm trying to get you in on it. It had never rained on the earth. The Bible says that God watered the earth through a mist at that time. So it had never rained. Noah began to build this ark, and people come along and say, what are you doing? He said, I'm building an ark. What's that for? It's going to rain. Rain? What do you mean rain? It never rain. It has never rain. What are you talking about? Come again? Well, God's going to destroy the world. Oh, yeah, right, right. Can you imagine what Noah went through? You know, you think that sometimes when you're witnessing the kind of stuff that you go through sometimes when you're sharing the love of Jesus, can you imagine the jokes 
that Noah must have had to encounter as an example. How many Noahs does it take to install a light bulb? Five. One holds the light and the other four turns the chair. Oh, really? <laughs> Can you I'm trying to get you in on it. Can you imagine the jokes and the stuff that he had to go through? But he built the ark. Look at Genesis chapter 7, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteousness before me in the generation. He not only engineers the ark in preparation, but he enters the ark. Notice who's giving, giving the invitation here. It's God. It's God who said, come thou and all thy house into the ark. That's the beautiful picture of salvation. There's only one door. Somebody said there's only one door. <laughs> I'm telling you, this symbolizes salvation. There was only one way that you could get into the ark. You had to go through that door. And so the time came and the Lord said, come enter into the door. By the way, this is the first time this beautiful word is listed in the Bible. Come, come. If I count it correctly, there are 678 times this word is used in the Bible. It's the great word of salvation. God said to lost humanity, come. Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28, he said, come unto me all ye that are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Somebody, he said, I will give you rest. The closing pages of the Bible says, and the spirit and the bride say come, and let him that heareth say come, and whosoever will come, and let him take of the water of life freely. Revelation chapter 22, 17. And you know Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18, come thou and let us reason together. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Somebody said the word come is one of the great words in the Bible. It denotes salvation. Noah did what God commanded him to do. And then we're told that the animals came in. Can you imagine that sight? As if, as if, By God-given instinct, these animals began to make their way into the ark. Look at Genesis chapter 7, verse 16. And they that went in, went in, male and female, of all flesh, as God had commanded him. Genesis chapter 7, verse 16. And they that went in, went in, male and female, of all flesh, as God had commanded him. And the Lord shut him in. When they were in the ark, notice the last part. And the Lord shut them in. The Lord closed the door. I'm trying to tell you that you and I are secure in the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way that you can ever lose your salvation is for somebody to get through Jesus and somebody to get through the Holy Spirit and somebody to get through God. What a sight it was. What a picture it was. They were in the ark. And so this is an Old Testament picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, you come unto him and you're, 
now located in Christ Jesus. Again, this is an Old Testament picture of what it means to be in Christ. What a sight it was. What a picture it was. Let me ask you a question today. Are you in the ark? The first word is revelation. Second word is preparation. The third word is demonstration. Look at the latter part of verse 7 in Hebrews chapter 11. Look what it says, by which that is, by his witness and faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is of faith. You see, what we have here, by Moses' demonstration, it's a twofold demonstration, according to this verse. First of all, there's the demonstration of condemnation, and secondly, there's the demonstration of salvation. You see, what Noah does by the ark is that he draws a line in the sand between himself and the human race, and by his testimony, by his witness, and by the building of the ark and going into the ark, by that he condemns the world. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He began to preach. I want us to go out to the edge of town where Noah is building his ark. Probably as we enter the construction site, as he's preaching to the people, that there's going to be a flood. And that you better get in to the ark. Somebody said, there's old Noah out there still preaching. Oh, goofy Noah. I think there have been times that he went on a preaching mission. For 120 years, he was a preacher of righteousness. Warning the people of judgment. Warning the people that one day a flood is going to come. That's what the Christian life is all about. It's about witnessing to the wonderful love of Jesus, getting people in to heaven. That's why you get friction sometimes. That's why it gets uncomfortable sometimes. You really don't have to do anything as a Christian. The very fact that you living a Christian life condemns this old world. On the other hand, his faith is demonstrated by salvation. By faith, he not only condemned the world, but became heir of the righteousness of God. There came a time that Noah and his family get into the ark and they about to shut the door. And that, that evening, David Muir is there representing television, and he sees an unusual occurrence. He sees the animals coming into the ark from all over the place. Good God Almighty, the door has been shut. People out there are gawking and still making their jokes. But Noah and his crowd are quiet as they come into the ark. Then I think about that time for the first time there was a drop of water. Somebody said, what is that? They said, it's a drop of water. And then another drop. Hallelujah. And then another drop. And then it was a downpour. The windows of heaven opened up and the great fountains of the deep began to burst forth with water. Water is everywhere. The jokes have stopped now. People are beginning to run to the high places. Lions and bears are screaming 
in their rage to get to a higher point. Men, women, boys, and girls are running to the hilltop. Screaming eagles and vultures are circulating and circling in the air. Finally, men got on the hilltop and they're cursing and beginning all over the mountains, screaming and hollering as the lapping of water against that old ark. I remember when I was a young preacher boy, I was preaching about Noah. And I said, you know, it's sad that nobody got saved. Uh, and I waxed an elephant that night on the fact <laughs> that nobody got saved. And I remember this old senior family invited me to the house and I was having dinner uh -huh. and I remember the brother said young man you preached a wonderful sermon but didn't Noah and his family get saved I said oh yes he said well young man and I never shall forget this he said, any man who gets his household saved is not a failure. Have I got a witness here? <laughs> and I never shall forget that. Because that's true. Anytime you get your family saved, you are not a failure. I can almost imagine Japheth, who was one of his sons, and he was a professor in the University of Nod. And some of his students said to him, said, Professor Japheth, he said, there's a man saying it's gonna rain. And they call him Goofy Noah. He said, you know, Professor, it's not going to rain scientifically. It's not possible to rain. It's never rained before. Right. Professor Japheth said to his students, well, who is it out there saying it's going to rain? They said, well, it's so goofy Noah. And Professor Japheth said, listen, students, I don't know all the ins and out about it, but I grew up in that household and Noah is my daddy. And if my daddy says it's going to rain, it's going to rain. Somebody say hallelujah. And his second son, Ham. You know, Ham probably rebelled and lived a lifestyle of rebellion. You know it happens sometimes. Maybe Ham one night was in a bar somewhere, living it up, and they are cracking jokes about this goofy man named Noah. And I hear him saying, what's his name? And I hear them saying, Noah. He said, well, listen, listen, I don't know all about it, but he dropped his beer can and said, that's my father. And I'm going home and get in the ark because my daddy has never lied to me. And if he says it's going to rain, somebody holler, it's going to rain. <laughs> Good God Almighty. And then that's Shem. Shem who lived at his daddy house trusted in his daddy's God. When the time came, he got into the ark. I just want to tell you that nobody is a failure who saves their family. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Noah. Thank God for being a witness to the goodness of God. Thank God for being a witness 
to the promises of God. Whatever God says, you can bank on it. Somebody said, you can bank on it. Whatever God says, whatever promises he makes, he can stand behind them. I don't care how difficult they might seem to be. If God said it, I believe it, and that sells it. I've since corrected that. If God said it, what I believe it or not, it sells it. Because when God speaks, man can lay down and die. When God speaks, he can raise people from the dead. When God speaks, he's the bread for your hungry and water when you're thirsty. When God speaks, nobody can speak like God. When God speaks, you need to listen. Glory to God. When God speaks, somebody need to say hallelujah. Bless his holy name. In God, I live and move and have my being. In God, Oh, the righteousness of God. Mm. That's enough. That's enough. Thank God for His Word. Thank God for His Word. What a word it is, what a word it is. Mm. God spoke, nor heard, and he heeded what God said. It's to happen in that order. When we hear the word of God, we're to heed the word of God and do whatever he says. I want to amplify a couple of things uh, that I talked about in the message. I talked about faith. Jesus talked about uh, faithless generation, uh, how important it is to have faith. And let me give you a working definition, first of all, for faith. Faith is the ability to trust what God says and act upon it, regardless of the circumstances on the outside and your emotions on the inside. That's a working definition of faith. You see, faith is currency in heaven. Money is currency on earth. And so you need faith. You can cash it in, <laughs> in heaven's bank account, by trusting the Lord. And one of the things he said to disciples today, and I, I talked about that, the second time he mentioned the mustard seed, he's talking about growth and development. Faith can grow. In Mark chapter four, verse 40, he says, how is it that you have no faith? And then in Matthew 6, 30, he says, oh, ye of little faith. And then in Matthew 15, 28, he says, great is thy faith. No faith, little faith, great faith. <laughs> faith has to grow. Well, how does it grow? It grows by the obstacles and the difficulties that comes into our lives, we take advantage of those through faith. That's how it grows. Those situations will stretch us along the way. But listen to the Apostle Paul. Paul said, listen, this is the reputation that I want to leave, and I'm going to leave. Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, he says, I fought a good fight. He says, I fought. He said, everything that threatened me, I threatened it back. He said, I left no energy unspent. I fought. You got to fight. Then he says, I finished my course. You got to hang in there. You say, he said, I didn't leave the game in the third quarter. <laughs> you know, a lot of people want to leave the game in the third quarter. You, oh God, you can't walk off the field in the third quarter. Paul said. I finished my course. I stayed through the fourth quarter. That's what you got to do. 
And then he said, watch it. He said, I kept the faith. <laughs> I kept the faith. And because I kept the faith, I could fight and I finished. <laughs> Bless his name. That blesses me all over again. And so we praise God that your faith can grow. And you can move from no faith to little faith to great faith by taking advantage of the obstacles that the Lord allows to be put in our path. And so remember that. Bless his name. All right, listen. Thank you for standing with us. And uh, uh, I just want to make a special appeal to, to our friends, uh, not only our members, but our friends who, who watch uh, send a donation. We, we, we need it, but we still have our ministries and we, uh, we're still doing good work. Uh, we need you to come alongside of us and uh, help us in the time of need. God bless you. May the Lord keep you. Till next week. I'll see you then.